All right. So today we're talking about that high school students being wizards and doing magic stuff that kids love, because kids love the idea that they too could end up becoming wizards like this, and that ultimately, at a certain point, ends up getting a lot more adult and serious with it in a way that feels like a bit of a departure from the initial first outings. No, 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 I'm, I'm not doing Harry Potter again. I'm not sure why that is here. Because I'm obviously talking about Wizards of Waverly Place. Because and because we have to go through about seven episodes, and I want to avoid this turning into a three-hour affair, th though I know that the chances of that happening are still pretty damn high. We're going to cut the intro short, as our episodes that we care about come in during the middle period of season four, when we've already established the rules that only one of the three children can ultimately inherit the magic powers that will allow them to run the shop, and instead the show has gone way off the rails, as Alex, the main character, told the whole world that magic exists. I'm gonna call a bunch of reporters over and expose that the government is holding wizards. The whole world will see that wizards are people too. Justin is teaching a bunch of delinquent wizards how to pass at WizTech, while also in this season dating an angel, who turns out to be an angel of darkness, and is making him evil to achieve some nefarious goal, that then leads into a whole potential future war between the angels and wizards that doesn't end up happening because they end up saving the world. Max is turned into a girl for a bunch of episodes too, because, well, because everyone else is doing something wacky, so I guess he needs a plotline too. They also have ghosts and asteroids and zombies and no, no, no. I said simplify this. We're not doing a brief look at Wizards of Waverly Place. With all of that said, this is the perfect segue to mention a great resource to use if you were living in the frankly politically nightmarish situation I just described from the wizarding world, or, I guess, our own modern world, which is just as complex sometimes, the sponsor of this video, Ground News. Ground News is a website slash app whose mission statement is to give its readers an objective, or as objective as you can get, way to interpret the news. It breaks every story down into the component parts of the sources reporting on it, and then feeds you data about the political biases, factuality, and ownership of said sources, giving you the information to make informed decisions about what you trust on each story. For an example relevant to this video, I looked up Wizards of Waverly Place, mostly just to see what would come up, and they're doing a sequel series, apparently. Well, we click on that story, and it gives us all 40 articles referring to this, and to the return of Selena Gomez and David Henry to their respective roles. It also tells us that for some reason, the majority of sites reporting on it were left-leaning news, at a pretty substantial 55% left to 9% right. I guess Fox and Breitbart are too busy being mad at Dylan Mulvaney to care about Wizards of Waverly Place. And if you look at the factuality, we see that most of those sources are reliable. 61% high factuality. Which means that we can pretty safely assume that Wizards of Waverly Place 2 is going to happen. Maybe Justin Russo's kid will be transgender and I get a whole new episode to make a video on. It's also quite fascinating to see who owns these new sources. Like, a lot of the media outlets are run by the Walt Disney Company media conglomerate, which basically means this is Disney-owned media reporting on a possible new Disney series. Just a bit weird congratulating yourself like that. But back to ground news. They also let you quickly see differences in titles on stories and between political biases. Like how the entirety of leftist and centrist articles are neutral in the title or positive about the return of the series, but the right wing section contains the only title with any negativity about it, from the New York Post owned by the Murdoch family. Is there some beef going on between Murdoch and Disney that we don't know about? 
Is this just a case of the New York Post utilizing negativity to farm views from people? If you use ground news enough, you could probably figure that out. A fantastic feature from the website slash app as well is the blind spot feature, which contains stories that are underreported by either left or right wing media. What that means is that you get to see the kind of articles that might not exist within the sphere of content you consume, and also just shows what is considered interesting to the readers that they are targeting. Like how for the right wing, there are no articles about Trump's condo selling worse than those that removed his name, while on the left, there are no articles about a non-citizen being appointed to an election commission in California. It's interesting to note who cares about what, especially in this election year. Ultimately, ground news can make understanding stories easier. It can give you information directly that helps to interpret and understand the diverse narratives that make up the modern media landscape. And for an autistic person like me, it's a bunch of extra numbers and stats and details that are amazing to really sink your teeth into. Not like I needed more things to do that though, honestly. They're not supported by any media conglomerates or big tech companies, instead being solely invested in the mission of giving people more transparent news, which is a good thing. So if you like the sound of all of that, then you can subscribe right now at ground.news slash Lily Simpson, link in description or pinned comment, and get 30% off the Vantage plan, which offers unlimited access to all their features. Try it today for around $5 a month and help support an independent platform attempting to make the news more trustworthy in a time when audience trust is at rock bottom in it. So now it's time to get into our first episode. Season 4's episode 5, Three Maxes and a Little Lady. A title which refers to the fact that there will be three Maxes and a little lady. It's not complex, just like the gender swap here isn't that complex either. I think they just did it so the actor could go on vacation. Anyway, the episode starts with the dad being frustrated by Max's behaviour. The fact that he got himself into a cotton candy cocoon again, and so suggests that Max needs to get into this big fancy club for wizards thing that will presumably teach them good manners and all that jazz that goes along with good manners. They take future wizards and they mold their minds into becoming, oh, guys like that. Justin and Alex, on the other hand, are arguing over the family wizard competition and the fact that Alex is going to start her own class to try and get one over on Justin, a fact which is literally just to blackmail him into teaching her some stuff on how she can win that competition. The rivalry between these two siblings is a consistent theme. I mean, all of them have a rivalry because of that whoever wins the family magic thingy imaging gets to inherit while the others go off to do other stuff. I want you to take my place. But I'm not a wizard. Well, I think I can handle that. I know how this show ends later this very season, and I don't understand why Willy matters so much. Because the losers still get some pretty sweet long-term prospects shit, too, that actually honestly seems more up their alley, to be honest. Regardless, that's not the purview of my video here. By God are we not doing a brief look at Wizards of Waverly Place, no matter how many views or likes this video gets. If you want to see that, you can go and watch Kean Carlisle, or you can go and harass Quinton Reviews into doing it. I'm just going to stick to my transgender swap thing and stay here. The rivalry, however, does matter to us because it's sort of the impetus, in a way, for the whole gender swap of the episode that is going to play a big part of the entire midsection of season 4. I also want to take this moment to address the fact that Wizards of Waverly Place sucks. I get that a lot of kids, myself included, grew up on this show, but these jokes are really bad and do not hold up in regards to being funny. Take this scene with the 
Boston accented? I, I, I'm just guessing. I actually have no idea about American accents. Well, the something accented head of the Wizarding Competition Family Contest organization, or whatever they call it. All I asked for was an aquarium in my office. My office in an aquarium. The audience is laughing, but I don't really feel like they should be. How was that funny? And on Max's end, the sophisticated wizards turn out to be a bunch of stuck-up assholes that are super demanding. You know, wow, who could have seen that one coming? And all of that means that Max, a child who I would describe as outgoing and excitable, does not blend in well with the vibe of the group. My brain! Someone's just come out my brain! <laughs> <laughs> and yet, they invite Max to join which is a surprise to everybody, but probably means some nefarious asshole reasons behind that selection. On the other side of things, Alex and Justin are doing a bunch of morph spell stuff in his class. And, uh, I see the seeds are being sown now. These wizards can turn stuff into other stuff. Like how Alex turns herself into a tiny, tiny shed. Which surely is going to end up playing some part in Max becoming Maxine. More fish, more fairy, and more fish, please, shack. I hope so, anyway. Because otherwise the whole narrative doesn't really have cohesive planning to it, if not. There's no setup and payoff if that doesn't occur. Max then mentions in a scene that I should just skip past that he lost his wand one time and they found it a year later when he got an x-ray. Remember that time I lost my wand and we found it a year later when I got that x-ray? <laughs> <laughs> to which I want to know what does that mean? How did the wand get into presumably his body? How did he not notice it getting into presumably his body in a way that it was considered lost? How did that not have any adverse effects on him, and how did it take a year to notice a presumably large object presumably inside of you? All horrifying questions that the show cannot and will not answer. It also seems at this point that the club is taking an interest in Max so that they can take a shot at Justin, because they don't want him to get into their club and win the competition because it would threaten the leader's role and also because they enjoy laughing at Max too. <laughs> we cannot lose this delightful fellow. He's our own personal buffoon. <laughs> and there it is. There it always is. Every time a group of rich sounding asshats gets a person that they think is stupid into their club, it's so they can laugh at them. Think it's always sunny in Philadelphia because that's the first thing that came to my mind, so we're gonna have to share that reference. You see, you thought you all could get together and play your little games and have some fun, you know? Invite some geeks to the ball. Max then, under the tutelage of this potentially evil club, brings the wizard competition family thing forward to super, super soon, because he is so far ahead, and that means that he can just win it due to all the screwing up that Justin and Alex have been engaging in over the past uh, give or take three seasons. In response, Alex uses that more spell knowledge to turn herself into Max, so that she can then change the date back. Something which I would assume they have safeguards against. Firstly though, it's weird that they have a rule where the person who is super far ahead in the contest can make it finalize whenever they want. Like, I get that it's in cases where the lead is so vast that it's impossible to surmount for the other competitors, and they just want to finish it off so they can all move on. But the other siblings are acting like they can come back into this contest in a year to catch up to Max. So I mean it's crazy that with only that kind of gap, Max can just end this. But also, the supervisors for the contest would have anti-morph detectors to stop people from abusing their powers and cheating the rules like this. Right? Anyways, Alex turns into Max, Max wearing Alex's clothes, which I worry that the laughter of the audience is about that, because laughing at guys in women's clothing is a pretty standard go-to comedy 
for almost all the kids media that I review. It, it's a serious issue built out of the fact that we view people breaking gender norms as inherently worthy of mockery, and a joke in and of itself with no additional elements added on. A guy in dress is in a guy in dress is automatically funny because of what it is. And all Alex has to say about becoming Max is that she is now itchy in a bunch of places. Like, that's it. You just body swapped to the different sex, and that's all you got? I mean, I guess Alex was a small shed and a toy beaver in the episode so far. Maybe being a boy isn't that much of a problem anymore. But I'd still feel like you'd comment on it. Alex, why are you wasting my time? You're supposed to turn into Justin Bieber, not just a beaver. <laughs> and I've got to stop this road that we are on to quickly go instead to this scene, where Fidel, the leader of the sophisticated wizards club, is abusing compliments to get people to do what he wants. And then he says this. See what I told you? They want to serve us, they just don't know it. Based on the fact that he has only used compliments and charm on women, that's a fucking horrible, horrible sexist thing to say. Like, this dude is the Andrew Tate precursor or some shit. Max and his dad have a heart-to-heart -heart about how, while his dad was hoping for them to be a good influence on Max, in fact, the sophisticated club are manipulating him and laughing at Max, which is not what he wants Max to be like. No, 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 no. I'm the one who should be apologizing to you. Now, I don't want you to be like one of those jerks. It's a nice parent moment, but it does have this funny little line where the dad says this. I want you to be just the way you are, Max. Now, considering what we know is going to happen in the end of this episode, Max, being the way that he is, is going to get a whole lot more complicated. Wait, where the hell did that come from? And then this episode turns into an opportunity for Max's actor to show off his chops, as Justin also morphs himself into Max, and we have to see Max playing his siblings like they were his siblings occupying Max's body. Max? Girl clothes, jewelry, Alex. <laughs> yes, I came to change the date back too. You know, he actually pulls off pretty damn well. It's it's very convincing stuff. All the Maxes have a sidebar where Max is rightfully angry that his siblings stole his image to go behind his back. Like that is fucked up and absolutely should have some wizarding rules against it. And now Max is going to not change the contest back, specifically because both of them abused his trust. This then turns into a full-on brawl in the middle of the contest admin's office. A contest admin whose total amount of giving a shit numbers somewhere around about zero. Then, when Max seems like he has won, the other two cast spells at the same time on Max, which turns him into a little girl. Give his body Give me a half a week. In response to this, finally, the admin lady steps up and puts the contest back to its original date because she's lost her shit and, and honestly doesn't care what's happening here. Justin and Alex are super stoked about this for obvious reasons, which feels cruel, because the entire time they are happy and cheering for themselves for getting what they wanted, Max is asking why he got referred to as a little girl. But Monday is off. <laughs> why did she just say little girl? Tad odd. You'd think that somebody would notice that they are no longer in the body of a teenage boy, but in fact a much younger girl. I don't know, I've, I've never body swapped before. Maybe, maybe it's a more subtle thing than you think. But that's just a record of mine that you'd, you'd probably pick up on it pretty quickly. We then find out that unfortunately, due to the nature of how both Alex and Justin cast spells at the same time, this is not so simply reverted which means that Max is stuck being played by this new actor. And the siblings decide to go with the lie to Max and hope he doesn't notice route, which he finally does notice when they go with that option, all the different body stuff that comes with this new body. Honestly, 
I don't know how long Justin and Alex thought that pretending he was back to Max would last, but kind of a desperate plan. Honestly though, most of their plans are desperate plans, so what's new? And in response to Max asking about all this new body stuff that they can tell, the other two teleport out. What shit siblings? Just shove your brother into this forced feminization magic and then bounce when the heat comes on you. In the credits scene, where they're figuring out how long this new actor has got before the other actor comes back, so, sorry, how long Max is going to be stuck being a little girl, yeah that, that's the right one. It's interesting to note that they refer to her as a her, not a him. She may be a little girl, but she definitely has Max's doggy breath. <laughs> like, for them, being turned into a girl has in some way transformed their view of his gender identity too. Which is not necessarily true, and it's entirely likely that Max is going to have some serious issues with adjusting to this new life, especially if he liked being a boy or being referred to as a boy. Or, alternatively, maybe Max is so stupid that getting gender swapped against his will doesn't mean anything to him, and he's going to be fine. That's always a possibility for Wizards of Waverly Place to go with, just so they can avoid any of the difficult conversations that come out of doing a gender swap narrative. The kind of conversations that help to feed the trans metaphor and interpretation of the events that I'm here for. The only way you're going to find the answer to this is by watching the rest of my video on the other episodes. Haha, <laughs> I've, uh, I've got you hooked now. Hope you like at least another hour of Wizards of Waverly Place shit. Looks like you're gonna be stuck like this for a while. Oh, and quick aside at the end of this episode to help feed that whole Alex and Justin are terrible siblings vibe, the response that Alex has to finding out that Max is stuck like this for an indefinite period is to tell him slash her to stay out of her wardrobe. <laughs> you stay out of my closet. <laughs> Uh, damn, bitch! You put Max in this position, it's your reckless spellcasting that did it. Have a little sympathy and stop being an ass for two seconds, you selfish twat. I know that Alex is meant to be our protagonist character, but I really don't like her. And I'm curious to see if the next five episodes will dissuade me from that fact and make me think that maybe she's okay being the lead role. Please, Wizards of Waverly Place stands. Tell me why you think she's a good character for the audience, actually, in the comments. Feed me that engagement so you can point out what I presumably missed about the show. Anyways, we are moving, moving, moving to the next episode. Season 4's episode 6, Daddy's Little Girl. And I'm so, so sorry, but what the hell kind of title is that? Time and context has made that sort of statement significantly creepier than perhaps it was intended to be, but to be Franklin for two seconds, I reckon that this episode is going to be pretty weird regardless of the title, thanks to that whole teenage guy getting force femmed into a prepubescent girl by magic. Kinda hard to avoid things getting odd when that's the premise you've got. But we begin with the show setting up its premise for us. The premise that Alex and her father get along quite well. That there is a strong bond there forged by the dad-daughter thing. Showcased by both of them liking this flapjack place that they use as part of their monthly father-daughter event. Only for this all to get interrupted by Max getting dragged downstairs by his slash her mother. I'm... I'm gonna have to figure out those pronouns at some point, but to show off the femme clothes that he slash she is wearing. Come on, show them! <laughs> and through this whole scene, it's kind of clear that everyone else is having fun with Max's new gender and his forced femness, or not caring about it, but Max clearly does not like being a little girl. It's possible that a part of this episode is going to be dedicated towards showing Max that actually being a girl is fun and cool too. I mean, they gotta do something, because this bit has to last for multiple episodes, and how is it gonna go on if Max spends the whole time saying, I don't want to be like this, and everyone else is just like, uh, well, sorry. At its core, this is all kinds of messed up. 
from a gender politics stance. I don't even know what line to take here. So what I'm going to do instead is, is, is just keep going through the episode and hope that by the end of it, we reach some kind of clear conclusion. Oh, she's just so huggable. <laughs> we then find out that the dad is kind of a girl dad. And seeing this new cute daughter, well, it's triggering something inside of him. Something that perhaps challenges the bond with his other daughter. I'm the little girl in the house, okay? My dad and I are about to go on our father-daughter pancake breakfast. Another daughter who never really learned how to have sisters competing with her for that father's attention because she was the only girl and now she just got a sister through magic for a little bit. Ooh, the conclusion of this episode is getting muddier by the second. I don't think it's going to be good. The parents are being weird here. The dad talks about how cute the pouty face Max is pulling is, the pouty face that exists because Max is not having a good time, and then the dad says this line. Let's go get some breakfast and have a man to boy trapped in a little girl talk. Let's go. Is that, is that a trans mask line? It, it feels like a trans mask line, right? Like, I could see a father saying that to their son, that they don't maybe have the full language to communicate with, or that they're not, like, fully accepting of, but they're trying, you know? Honestly, along with figuring out what the hell's going on here, the big thing I guess I'm searching for is what part exactly is going to speak to what part of the trans community in this show. Or, is this going to flip-flop around enough that every side can sort of get a little piece of that head cannon pie. But yeah, Alex is jealous about this new attention being fostered on Max, because they are a little girl. Out comes Alex with a bit of what certainly feels like transphobia. Please, I am daddy's little girl. That is daddy's little freak. <laughs> Thanks, Alex, for building my case that you suck. Appreciate it. Now, in the next scene, where Alex's friend Harper is suggesting outfits for Max, Alex is back to using male pronouns for Max, opposed to what she did in the previous episode where she used female pronouns. I, I, I'm, I'm never going to figure out what the writers intended here because, honestly, I don't think they intended anything. They just saw a gender swap as a cheap gimmick to run with for some stories rather than considering the ramifications and going somewhere with them. You know, never underestimate the laziness of TV show kids writers. Trust me, I know, seen plenty of it. And to cement this further, when the dad is defending Max from having to do work, he says that he is just a little girl, and that's why he can't clean the fryer. Alex, he's just a little girl. <laughs> you do it. This is the gender confusion that I have also dealt with from some of my family members and friends. So I guess this is actually just a very realistic look at what trans people deal with. Stuff not exactly like this, but with, with some, some similarities to this setting occur. People have set in stone reactions to things that influence how they engage with language. Even if a the language they are using is confused or not actually accurate. The dad still thinks of Max as a guy, but sees him visually as a little girl, and so is confusing those two things together. We then see what makes Max start acting like a little girl around other people, and it's the realisation for Max that he can use being a little girl to get out of doing things. The old classic abusing a gender swap for ulterior motives. We've seen this one before a few times now as well. I probably can't do a lot of things anymore. <laughs> right, Daddy? Oh. <laughs> It's also, frankly, stranger that the dad is encouraging this. Like, he is full-on supporting Max, exploiting being a little girl to get what he wants, because the dad is also getting what he wants too, which is to be the father of a little girl again. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. One second. Okay, that should help. And now we get the name and the backstory for this new Max character. It's Maxine from North Dakota, who is their cousin. And Max is mad about being called Maxine because it's a girl's name, which makes me think that while they will abuse the new gender to get what they want, they absolutely still identify as a boy and with ideas of masculinity 
So I guess this story does truly go out to the trans mask community. Hooray? Maybe? Max. Eam. Maxine. Maxine. Come on, that's such a girly name. And for some reason, they really need to make sure this guy, Zeke, doesn't find out that Max has been turned into Maxine. Which I sort of get, because they got into massive trouble for exposing the Wizarding World previously. A fake-out exposure that was really just a test by the Wizarding community, but, you know, it doesn't matter really. But also, also, Harper is immortal too, and knows about Wizard. And Zeke finds out that they are wizards later on, and neither of those cause massive issues for them that they can't just smooth over. So I don't know why Zeke needs to be in the dark this late into the show. It's called the Gaelic Clog Dancing Exhibit and Luncheon. Duh. Max goes to his karate class to sign up to become a new student, because he can't take his normal place in the class for a host of reasons, and we get a kind of racist interpretation of the karate master and leader of the dojo. In my dojo, we do not sign up for class, we become the class. A lot of stereotypes here played for comedy. The sort of stuff that I think Disney would rather you all forgot that they okayed and did. And it is sort of cool to see here that Max is, as a girl, still acting a lot like Max previously would making comments about how his feet stink to some level of pride, a nice showcase of how being a little girl doesn't change the inherent identity that Max has, a reiterated point that I do think solidifies the headcanon we can take here of viewing this as a trans mask story with magical bullshittery in play. Justin plays the I don't fight girls card before getting his ass kicked by Max because, well, because Max still has all the karate knowledge in this body, a scene that is pretty funny. If you and I were to throw down, I know you got a black belt. Ah! Whoa. Hey. Oh. And also, very enjoyable that the karate master is totally on board with this girl as far as he is aware of, kicking the shit out of Justin, because Justin called Max Maxine. It's actually sort of weird now that I think about it, because they could realistically just have Maxine or Max transition briefly while they solve the problem. Like, Max could just keep being Max, and they could maybe use some morph magic to alleviate any dysphoria that he might feel. They have magic that can do that, right? I feel like magic should really smooth any gender trans stuff over by quite a lot. Honestly, I think the only reason that they're not doing that is because none of the family gives two shits about Max not liking being a little girl. And the dad clearly seems to prefer it, which could certainly be perceived in a transphobic light if you wanted to do that. Hey, I'm just pointing it out, you know, don't get mad at me if people say that this is a, this is a transphobic thing for the family to be engaging in. Alex is being a little weird wearing a bunch of old clothes to try and get her dad to notice her again. The jealousy thing that's the core of the episode for our main character. You're making your father's favorite sandwich, huh? And wearing clothes from when you were little. Are you trying to get his attention? But to my previous point, if Alex wants to fix this, she could just use her magic and collaborate with Max to help him transition into a boy before they can magically turn him back into who he was. Surely there are some spells that could be of some aid right now, right? I've seen them do some wild stuff on this show. McReary time real. Whoa! But no, no, if Disney did that, they would have to admit that trans people exist. And while they're certainly happy to use the vague notion of gender swapping and cross-dressing for comedy, they certainly can't put any actual trans stuff into a prime-time kids show back in the ancient past of 2011. You know, back then if a cis straight person saw anything remotely actually queer rather than just hinted at for laughs, well, it, it, would, it would melt their tiny little brains right out of their ears. Max then continues to use that little girl cuteness to get their father to do whatever they want, in spite of Alex's best efforts because of, well, because of everything this show has shown us so far. 
Come on, are, are you paying attention? The dad likes little girls, he's a girl dad, and Alex can't beat an actual little girl for the attention. Do you want to take me out for some ice cream? Sure, I'm not doing anything. Uh, uh, but, but daddy... And at this point, I get it, I get the theme. But where is this going though, Wizards of Waverly Place? You've hammered this point home, we're in the second half of the episode now, start cementing some sort of realization and commentary on the setup that you've done. Alex, there's nothing in these books to change Max back. What are you doing? Oh, okay, the second half is Justin and Alex teaming up to go after Max. Wait, where have I heard this one before? The previous episode? which ended with them casting some terrible magic on Max that trapped him in a body that he didn't want after they went behind his back to abuse his image to cheat. Petition back, so we had to do something. Oh, so you turned yourself into me and went behind my back? Is this how every episode of Wizards of Waverly Place is going to go? With the two older siblings ganging up on the younger one because the younger one is more successful and accomplishing shit and getting noticed? Because Power to Max, honestly, if that's true. They are fighting the odds here. Alright, so Justin and Alex are now hard committed to reading all the books and smashing back the information to figure out how to turn Max back to himself. Motivated not by the fixing their mistake thing, but by the jealousy aspect which definitely paints both of them as continually shit people with no concern for anyone but themselves. Are we sure these are the main characters and not the main villains? I like Max the most so far because he was the only one who at any point in the last two episodes was willing to do the right thing for other people at no benefit to himself. He was willing to turn back the competition because it was the good thing to do. Alex and Justin just suck. To further that narrative, here, they are committing to a plan that could end horrifically for Max and going ahead with it anyway because they're both fine with the fact that it might turn him into an ogre or something worse. He could end up as something gross, like a uh, ogre. Of course, that. I am too, let's do it. So the two go to the dojo to cast a spell on Max there because they don't want to do it at home because Zeke will be around and see it and they can't let Zeke find out because of this and he is refusing to leave because he thinks everyone hates him and so is trying to force them to like him again by staying and doing chores which is... I mean his paranoia is wrong but not unjustified because everyone is lying to him they just don't hate him but I don't understand why they think casting the spell at the dojo is going to be less conspicuous than doing it at home there are more people at the dojo, people they don't know and don't have as much influence over to swear to secrecy if those people see, I don't know, a small girl turn into an ogre. I'm starting to understand why Alex and Justin are losing the family wizard contest. Max says this line about how they wanted to get turned back to ASAP as their mother is threatening to take them to get their ears pierced. Because mom wants me to get my ears pierced later. I'm starting to like the idea. <laughs> this complicates the trans mask storyline a little bit, possibly. Not that there's anything feminine about getting your ears pierced. Plenty of guys do do that. But in the narrative of a Disney kids show, getting your ears pierced is meant to be seen as a feminine thing. That's what the writers are getting at. That's why it's weird to Max for him to be kind of into it. Alex and Justin cast the spell. It doesn't work, obviously, and it just turns Max into more feminine. Like he has pigtails and pink bows and makeup and a lollipop now, because that's what being feminine is, I guess. Pigtails? <laughs> lollipop? You didn't change me back! Max commits to making their siblings' lives hell as retribution for the past two episodes worth of shit that he has had to deal with. And... I'm committed at this point to calling him Max and using male pronouns despite how he looks 
because he views himself as clearly being a boy in conversation still and hates being a girl, see the board, and that's the obvious trans positive way of engaging in Max's identity here, is to acknowledge that he is a boy, identifies as such, no matter what his body looks like. You know, looks don't define gender and all that jazz, it's pretty baseline shit. Alex then uses magic to give Justin karate powers with a fly swatting spell, don't ask questions, and this allows Justin to beat up Max. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray? Everyone is mad about this because, you know, Justin just beat up a little girl, even though, as Justin rightfully says, Max isn't a little girl, although that only leads to him getting more booze and, you know, what am I meant to say here? This whole thing is fucked from every perspective as a conclusion at this point. I'm gonna just commit to the fact that I like Max and I'm on Max's side, whatever side that is. That's all I've got here. Max is okay. Like, despite what the show is doing with Alex and Justin, trying to make us sympathise with their side of things, fuck those two. Seeing Max as a little girl makes me realise that I'm not anymore. They need to get over themselves and commit to fixing this indefinite forced gender swap they did on their brother to put them in a body that their brother did not want to be in. I'm sorry, but all of your petty little bullshit gets put to the side in this case. Grow the fuck up. I'm getting mad at cartoon characters again, aren't I? The episode ends with the family punishing Max by making him listen to Zeke's friend song, which just feels mean to both Max and Zeke, two characters who are forming the group I like to call these people are A-OK -okay and I will not stand for slander against them and wish the show would treat them nicer. And that's the episode. Should sing it for Maxine. No, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> well, think again. It goes like this. Which means it's on to the next one because, my God, we don't have the time to wait. Season 4's episode 7, Everything's Rosy for Justin. Now, as you can tell from the title, this one isn't Max-centric. So it should be a little bit of a faster ride as we skip all the redundant stuff that doesn't feed the storyline thread we are following. It's just the build up to the angel shit from the Wizards vs Angels episode thing that comes up for the additional mid-season twist alongside the Max being forced to magical gender swap. A whole new world of information that frankly just gets complicated lore-wise and most other shows normally just get by with a single mid-season twist to spur on audience interest. I Guess Wizards of Waverly Place was using the same playbook that Riverdale would in the future, where if you can make each episode have multiple twists, then presumably the audience will have to just stick around to find out what the hell's going on. I dropped out in the fourth grade to run drugs to support my nano. That means you haven't known the triumphs and defeats, the epic highs and lows of high school football. God, do I love Riverdale. Can't wait for the end of this year when I release the big brief look at Riverdale video as a surprise Christmas gift for my audience. Oh. I've said too much. In the episode, there is something in the parts that we shouldn't care about that I want to talk about anyways, because these are my videos. And that is how this coach lady shows up, tells the delinquent class that they have to do this silly wand drill thing, which I guess is a reference to like gun drills maybe, which makes me think, are wands equivalent to guns? in the magical world. Craft routine of wand twirling and spell casting in order to instill teamwork. I mean, wands are very, very dangerous and in the hands of irresponsible children allow so much damage. So, so actually, yeah, maybe they might be guns. But this wand drill class is apparently the thing that will let the delinquents get back into WizTech, their version of Hogwarts. But why is that the thing? Like, these people are in this delinquent class because they use magic in dangerous ways, and they need to learn how to better control it. I don't see why the final thing to get out of this delinquent class should be just moving a wand around and doing some poses. <gasps> oh. To be fair though, this whole class that we have seen so far doesn't really seem to have a good cohesive structure to it for actually helping the students, which does make me think that Justin is a shitty teacher who shouldn't be in charge of this. Regardless, 
none of this is Max related, so it's just something that caused me a tiny bit of confusion, and I need to avoid hitting myself, so let's just move on. On the other end of things, people are just coming to accept that Max is now stuck as a girl, because I guess everyone else is busy, I suppose? The dad is still super hyped about it, and the plot for this episode with them is trying to improve business, so he suggests utilising Max's new cute face to try and get customers to come to the shop, to the annoyance of Max, who, it bears repeating, doesn't want to be a little girl, and does not like this. Send him, look at his face! <laughs> like, I don't know, maybe someone should be working to fix this, rather than waiting for the solution to drop into their laps. I mean, what else could they be doing? Oh, I, I see that Justin is fighting with a literal child over the attentions of a new girl in his class. Hint, it's the evil angel, and that's uh, ruining the lessons. Guys only want one thing, and it's to put their wand into an angel see, am I right? Hmm. Yeah, I regret writing that sentence into my script. Wish I could take it back. A guy calls Max a little cutie, creepy as fuck, frankly, which of course he doesn't like because of that everything we've seen about Max so far. You know, maybe the trans mask metaphor is back online for Max here. And the resolution for their plotline in this episode, because Max refused to let people exploit his new cute face, and they went with punch cards instead, is to have the friend and family rag on Max for not letting his dad use his gender in a way that he isn't comfortable with to attract customers. Creepy, creepy customers who want to go to a sandwich shop because it has a small girl involved in it. Pose for my hair! <laughs> no bows for this cute little girl. Max proceeds to play the routine expected of him to get rid of all the customers who want a free sandwich per the promotion, and Harper, the mortal friend of Alex who just kind of sticks around even when Alex isn't there because she lives with the parents and works at their place, I guess, and it's just sort of part of the family, talks about how everyone learned a valuable lesson today. I think we all learned a very valuable lesson today. Yes, we did. Don't know what the fuck the lesson was, except for the fact that everyone else moved down on the exploiting girl Max chart, that Max needs to make use of his gender while he can to help the family despite the fact he doesn't want to and hates being perceived as a little girl. Is that the lesson? That customers will cheat the systems put in place by businesses to get free shit? Is that the lesson? That none of this really matters and we're just spinning our wheels until the actor for Max gets back from, I don't know, maybe voicing Fernando in Rio or starring in New Year's Eve or maybe just chilling on some island somewhere? Is that the lesson? Oh, also, here is the one drill, just to satiate any curiosity you might have around the literal decider of whether a bunch of these people get to rejoin regular wizard school. Enjoy! Also, also, look at the angel wings they ended up going with. This is going to make it impossible for me to take anything that happens with this whole Dark Angel storyline and the war between wizards and angels, not a real war, it's just like a couple of them fighting a couple of angels, seriously. How am I supposed to when they've got big, floppy toy wings strapped to their backs? On to episode 8, suitably titled Dancing with Angels, though I would love to see these angels dance with those stupid ass wings, and I think I might just get to. Now all the angels fly up! No! And this is yet another non-Max-centric episode, which means that I get to practice a little thing called restraint, and just deliver the information that we need to get through to the episodes that actually feature Max in some serious capacity, rather than sidelining him as a character. 
to do what I always end up doing and get stuck on some piece of information that horrifies me into caring more about something that I shouldn't care about, in the intro for this, Rosie the Angel reveals that angels often use mind messages to direct people into doing things, which she uses to tell Justin she likes him, but made me think, hang on, could that not be for a lot of people who don't know that it's an angel? Something that causes them to think they're hallucinating? That they have schizophrenia or any of the other myriad mental health issues that can cause you to hear voices? None of which are very good to think that you have. Sometimes we do it by sending mind messages. I like you. Yeah. How many people have angels caused to believe they were suffering something, when in reality it was just some poorly winged douche trying to push them into actions that are good? Also, we learn that the angels apparently have angel-only clubs in Los Angeles, which is a weird thing to have a character just know about. Like, how well established are angels? And doesn't angels existing make everybody want to know if there's a god as well? And in that case, which, which religion is right? And does the god of whichever religion is right support nightclubs? And also, a nightclub from angels in LA really makes me wonder. Thank whichever god it is that I'm not doing a brief look at Wizards of Waverly Place. That would be a nightmare to work on. And unfortunately we're going to spend some more time talking about the fact that the way they're going to sneak into the Angel Only Club is by wearing homemade angel wings. A disguise that only works because floppy, non-natural looking appendages with feathers is what regular angel wings look like anyway. So. Thank that previously mentioned god for that lucky coincidence on their part, huh? Let me see those wings! Those aren't Angel of Darkness wings, are they? They could have used magic, I guess, to make angel wings, because why would you not use magic for everything? Or what about Alex stealing Ozzy Osbourne's star from the Walk of Fame for Max to buy Max's silence about them going to LA? Doing it literally as Alex is about to meet a bunch of angels whose whole presumed thing is about being good. Nobody even noticed two teenage girls wearing wings ripping a star out of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I support women's wrongs as much as the next person, and personally I think it would be pretty hilarious to do that, but maybe if you're sneaking in it's worth doing some at least neutral stuff beforehand to maybe avoid the angels' attentions? And that you could convince Max with something less likely to trigger these holy divine creatures. Or, or, what about the remixed religious club music? Something that feels like a sin in and of itself. Max is relegated here to a B-plot that is all about lying to the parents on where Alex and Justin have gone. There isn't really any gender stuff to dig our teeth into, because the writers are frankly failing miserably to use this golden opportunity with Max to explore anything interesting about gender swaps. Instead just sort of taking it as an excuse for a couple of jokes here and there at most. It's a bit sad really to waste a multiple episode character arc like that. You could really get your teeth into some themes that other gender swaps like Boy Meets World and Fairly Odd Parents touched upon, but I guess sometimes some writers are just doing the bare minimum to scrape by with shows that are not trying to cause any ripples at all by, I don't know, accidentally saying something that means anything at all. Wizards of Waverly Place is a show that avoids morals and points in favour of just being popcorn TV for children. And personally, I think it ultimately hurts the narrative structures to be so bland. Being around all these angels is starting to make me feel like I should do the right thing. I really hope that wears off. Back to the episode. To get Max to speak, the parents decide to use that whole Max hates being a girl and doing feminine stuff to threaten Max with a child beauty pageant, 
saying that they will enter him into it if he doesn't spill the beans on where the other kids got off to. And look, Jerry, it's not too late to enter your 7 to 12-year-old girl. Yeah, but I'm a guy. Which is pretty cruel parenting. And if we are still using that trans mask metaphor, which of course we fucking are, have you seen what YouTube channel you're watching it on right now? Have you looked at what I do? You know my deal. Then this is some brutal stuff to do to your kid who is suffering what the show doesn't properly present as gender dysphoria, but it totally would be. Max has been forced to be a little girl, and he hates it and wants to be a boy again. This continues into them doing Max's hair, putting on tons of makeup, all to basically torture the kid because he fucking hates it, and like, good lord, please do not do this with your kids. Do not use gender stuff they don't like to get at them. Pretty basic parenting tip right there, I reckon. Also, don't enter them into a child beauty pageant at all. Those things are full on horrifying for multiple reasons and on multiple different levels. But of course, the parents do it, as it's Chekhov's pageant at this point. You bring it up, you gotta force the boy trapped in a girl's body to get up on stage in the most feminine possible outfit and perform for a bunch of adults so that you can try and force information out of that boy trapped in a girl's body. That's, that's a requirement of, of the narrative writing formula, basically. The judges act pretty creepy here. The parents are being assholes to the point that even when Max tells them the truth to get out of having to do the beauty pageant, his mum forces him onto the stage to perform so that he can win for her. Now, get up there and win this for mommy. But I told you where they went. Um, but we don't care about that. Jesus Christ. It's odd that this whole thing with Max is skirting around a massively fucked up storyline. Touching only upon it briefly when you consider it in relation to what the character is telling us. But the writers never really give it its due or properly address it on the journey of the episode. I'm hoping, I'm hoping they're going to do something with it for the episode where Max gets turned back into a boy. That he'll give us some insights into this whole experience that probably really should make him review his family and think about how bad they are for him. But these really should have been scattered throughout the appearances already. Those insights should already have existed all of the times that his family basically screwed him over because he got turned to a girl. The end of the episode is Alex and Harper having a laugh at Max for him getting entered into a beauty pageant. With Alex recognising how horrible it is, but also calling it hilarious. So that just makes it great in her eyes. I'm going to move her a little higher, I think. Oh gosh, that's awful. And hilarious, but those are my favourite combinations, so I like it. The Alex being a shit person train really does never stop. If you're on that ride, you are riding it till you die, like this is some kind of Twilight Zone episode. Remember, Alex is the reason that Max is stuck like this. It is Alex's fault. And yet, her and Justin are too busy going to angel nightclubs to fix the problem they caused. Okay, episode 9, Wizards vs. Angels. That's right. It's the big mid-season finale of this whole rosy arc thing that came up pretty fast and is finishing pretty quick too. Which means that this should be another pretty short Max Consideration episode. And we can speed through this as long as nothing comes up that I desperately need to address. Though the length of the episode at 50 minutes has me fucking worried about how quickly I can possibly get through this. Anyway, the whole intro is about the fact that Justin is becoming a more evil person thanks to Rosie's Angel of Darkness shtick. Doing stuff like stealing flowers or blowing his nose out on some random stranger's scarf. Hi. Hey. Though, I would like to point out, as I keep pointing out over and over again, that before Rosie turned up, Justin faked Max's identity to try and get back into the family contest because he was losing it so badly thanks to fucking up a bunch of times in previous seasons, and that in response to getting found out by Max, he then turned Max into a little girl 
and then didn't do anything to fix it until it became a problem for him and Max annoyed him because he was a little girl. That's when he gave a shit. I don't think Justin was a good guy before Rosie turned up. He could end up as something gross, like a uh, ogre. Of course, cool, that. I am too, let's do it. For Max, though, this episode is about how the teachers are all wondering where Max is at. Like he hasn't been showing up for classes for a bit. And, oh look, it's the consequences of the actions. The actions being nobody with magic in the family doing something to fix this problem before now. Back on the angel thing though, quickly, we learn that guardian angels exist. That they have a dispatch center where calls come in and then they go out and do things to help people. Guardian angel dispatch, what's the trouble? Angel 51, see the boy about to give a YG. Things that could mean that angels get perceived as hallucinations by people that see them doing good things that don't know that angels exist? Like, if you saw an angel just like turn and say, I'm gonna help you do the right thing, I would freak the fuck out and think that I was tripping. Also, do the calls come from everyone? Or do the calls just come from people who have the right religious beliefs where they believe that angels are real? Specifically, the angels that we see presented here. Because if you don't believe angels are real, and you ask for help one time in your head, or out loud, and an angel turns up to do some aid stuff, beyond just thinking I'm tripping, I'd also question, if it was real, is the Christian God the, the real one? Because there are only a set few religions that have modern day perceptions of angels which look like wizards presents them, and yes, these are not biblically accurate angels, so if you're a hardcore Christian who's into the Old Testament, you. You might also be a little confused when these guys show up looking like they're out of a classic movie. Monty, you're up! Thanks, Monty! Oh, he's kind of cute. Also, 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 while we're well into the weeds at this point, the guide that Alex has through the Guardian Angel Dispatch mentions a moral compass, which is just sitting on a pedestal out in the open. And whose moral compass is that? It's set to pure good, which makes me think it must be just the dispatcher's compass, right? But if they're angels, is it not impossible for them to do anything but good by their very inherent nature? But no, apparently the moral compass is everybody's moral compass. And in that case, why is it turned to pure good and yet bad things still happen in the world? Surely it should be like neutral or midway. But in the show they say that if it gets turned to bad, it would be really bad because people everywhere would act mean to each other and then, why is this out in the open, where anyone who gets into this area could mess with that compass? Alright, so what's this moral compass thing you do? It looks like a grown-up clock. Put it somewhere safer, you absolute fools. Put it in a vault. Out of further curiosity, this is a compass, which means it has multiple points in a circle. So, what if I got in there and I just like turned it a few degrees to one side? Does everyone just start acting like slightly shittier, but like occasionally good? Does it like change people's like natural alignments just like a little bit? What if I put it to pure neutral? Does that mean that the whole world balances out to an equal amount of good deeds and bad deeds? I just wanted to talk about a boy getting trapped in a girl's body. I didn't want to have to consider the logistics of angel culture, but I knew that my Little Brain would not be able to move past whatever absolute bullshit the writers decided to tack onto this plotline without thinking about it. When it's pointed to good, it gives guardian angels the power to help people make good choices. On that gender swap thing, Max goes to school pretending to be Maxine, using the excuse that they are doing a cousin swap thing for a period of undisclosed time, and now we get to see the excitement of Max existing as a girl in school. Can't wait to see what horrifying discoveries await Max there. You mean the kind of teacher that gives certain glances and giggles at all your jokes, and after she gets her good review, all she does is bark at you? The first major one is that he can't talk to any of his friends now, because he's a little girl and they're all teenage boys, and they just laugh at him whenever he tries to talk to them. Yep, he has to abandon all of his friends and learn how to make new ones, apparently, with the girls in his new classes which I have to imagine is some really upsetting stuff to discover about your life. Like, just imagine for a second, 
your whole life that you wanted is suddenly yoinked away from you and you're dumped with one that you don't feel prepared for and that you absolutely in no way wish to participate in. Now, my bet here from all the Genesis tropes I've watched is going to be that Max will ultimately learn that while this isn't great, that the girls he has to be friends with now because of his new situation are in fact totally able to enjoy the same things that boys do. And that gender is no barrier to owning noobs in a video game. What's up, guys? You want to go play some zombie circus later and own some noobs? <laughs> I mean, that's the obvious gender lesson here, that gender prescription is stupid and that people from a wide array of backgrounds can enjoy things without fitting into stereotypes. Let's see if the WALP, as I presume the show is called, writers can pull off this free and open goal for them in the narrative. And not to harp on about the same thing I always do, Alex has this moment where she realises that Rosie is an angel of darkness, Jesus Christ characters catch up already, it's pretty obvious, and that Rosie is changing Justin, which is a real shock to her because it's, it's horrifying, right? He's, he's been turned against his wishes into becoming something unrecognisable and a far cry from who he was previously that Alex knew. Fitz, can't you see what she's doing to you? She's influencing you, you're not yourself. Like Max, when Alex and Justin turned Max into a little girl. Yet they didn't do shit to fix that with the immediacy that Alex is trying to help Justin here. Also apparently, Angels of Darkness live in the Dark Realm, which means that all of them have successfully managed to beat Galeem in the Realm of Light, though presumably they haven't got past Darkon yet because they're still stuck there. I get it, pretty hard fight. Justin decides to stay with the evil angel chick, however though, because she's hot and into him and guys only want one thing, am I right? If that's what Justin wants. Rosie, I don't care what kind of angel you are, as long as we're together. I wonder here if these two storylines, the angel thing, is going to tie into the Max thing at all. Or if these are just two completely disparate mid-season character arcs that barely cross over with each other and are just like if two writers were writing two separate things in the same show. But back to the Max thing. Max makes no friends at school, it sucks for him, and Harper decides to fix that by throwing an impromptu slumber party, reasoning that that's what every girl wants, despite the fact that neither Max nor his parents think it's a good idea, thanks to the whole Max doesn't want to be a girl and that seems like a living nightmare for him to deal with reasoning. A slumber party! <laughs> I think we do want to say that's a bad idea. Harper, though, does it anyway because she wants summer party for herself. And wow, Harper, guess I can also consider you as one of the shitty people who ignore what Max wants in favour of your own desires. Great stuff. I don't think so, Harper. We have a little problem. <laughs> On the flip flip side, Rosie is using Justin to get to the moral compass for a very powerful ruler who hides in the dark realm. Malaketh, is that you? I'm, I'm gonna run out of dark place references at some point, presumably. But this is all a pretty simple plot line. We don't really need to spend more time on it, it's, it's going to progress to some kind of fight between some of the angels and some of the wizards with magic and wings and shit happening, you know? Boring, am I right? How's the, how's the slumber party going for Max? Um, is that, is that more interesting? And woo! Harper, when are we going to get to play? When I fall down? Oh, it, uh, it sucks. Harper is basically forcing a bunch of girls to enact her sick and twisted twister dreams until Max kicks her down and threatens her out with magic and the cops, which doesn't work, and it turns into Harper instead kidnapping a bunch of young girls and forcing them to stay there. No one's going home! Dance! Everybody dance! Someone needs to intervene here, right? Where are the adults? It also turns out that the rule of the Dark Realm is not Darkon, it's not Malaketh, in fact, it's John Rubenstein, very prolific and famous TV actor. The mighty wizard that we have chosen to fulfill the dream we've carried for ages. Wait a minute. John Rubenstein played Lance Horning on a legal show that didn't quite manage to land it, Shark, during an episode called Russo. 
and the last name of the wizards in Wamp is Russo. And the Russo brothers were heavily involved in the MCU, which features none of the people that are here. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's all not coming together. I'm also learning that David Henry, the actor for Justin, took evil to mean use a lot of your chin and jaw while you're talking. You're welcome, all of you. <laughs> Have a perhaps Do not ask for more. <laughs> it's not relevant just stood out to me as an interesting choice. People start acting terrible, which Alex finds funny, and then say she doesn't care about her brother anymore, to which the little guardian and training angel, who's her friend, realises that the Dark Realm has already won and taken the compass. Though honestly, I, I can't tell the difference between evil Alex and regular Alex. Why don't we plop down with a bag of something fried and watch people on the internet pretend they can sing? At the kidnapped slumber party, though, which I remind you happened before the evil twist, Harper kidnapped a bunch of kids before she was turned evil, Max has been forced by a crowd of girls into kissing a pillow and pretending that it's a boy. Come on, Maxine! Everyone else! Did it. Pretend it's Zac Efron and kiss the pillow. Sometimes the things that I say make me concerned. But thankfully for Max, the Dark Realm actually transforms all the girls from wanting to kiss a pillow while pretending it's Zac Efron to wanting to punch the pillow instead. Thank God, good save for him. But Max doesn't want to have this slumber party regardless. He doesn't like any of these people and the episode has already completely whiffed the storyline I thought it was going to do about the gender swap school thing. It hasn't shown that girls can actually go against feminine stereotypes. In fact, it's had them embody them more heavily, putting Max further off making friends with them because of course these girls don't play video games like he does, right? All girls really are just the same, they just want to kiss Zac Efron pillows. <laughs> Wizards of Waverly Place really fucking sucks, is what I want you to know here. And I feel so, so bad for anyone who watched this as a kid. Like I said near the start, I watched this as a kid and I feel bad for myself. I just question the moral lessons and the tropes that is reiterating for how healthy they were in encouraging kids to be able to explore things outside of stereotypes that are bland, uninteresting, and so common. Max proceeds to fix the problem, however, by turning all the young girls at the summer party into elderly gentlemen. Turn these girls into older guys. I, I think my brain just shut down. I, I, I said that line and then there's just nothing. Ah. That's not good. Are, are, are the old men? Still the little girls trapped in the old men bodies, or, or, or did the spell also transform their identities too? Because uh, they're certainly not freaking out like they just went through something that I presume must be traumatic as all heck, right? Like being turned from girls at a summer party into old men in pyjamas that must have ripped, right? Like those pyjamas weren't sized for old men and little girls. Uh, okay, let's just move on before I melt whatever is left of my brain. Anyway, Rosie was tricked by Gorob, who is actually going to destroy Justin because he hates outsiders. Ooh, bad people are xenophobic. Rosie likes Justin, however, so she goes to Alex to awaken whatever good is left in Alex to rescue her brother. Alex gets a pair of white wings so that she can go do battle in the Dark Realm, and Justin has a pair of black wings, which means we should be on track for some sibling wing flight fight in the episode. Though I also guessed that Max would learn a lesson about girls, and that these two separate stories would in some way interweave, and I've been fucking wrong about that, so let's just see how this pans out. Okay, they sort of do have an angel fight with the compass between them, pulling it back and forth between bad and good. I will give the writers a point for that one, even if the fight is a bit shit. Probably because they didn't have the budget for a real magical angel fight. The old men and the parents and Harper are all having a pillow fight because that's the most 
evil thing that could occur at a sleepover, I guess. And just when I thought the old man thing was the most traumatic element of the entire episode, the fight between good and evil causes the family and Mac to turn the little girls slash old men into fruit with faces, annoying orange style. Remember when annoying orange was a relevant pop culture icon? Luke, Luke, I am an orange. Yeah. Things were pretty dire back in the day. Skibbly Toilet's got nothing on that shit. However, when the fruit talks, it talks with the voice and the identity of the old men, not the little girls, which means that we are a few more layers deep here, like Inception, and that these guys are the ones who are suffering the torture of being fruit with faces, not the little girls. I wanna go home! This party stinks. <laughs> I think. Okay, this is starting to turn to an occupational hazard. Can we move on from the scrolling, please? I can't keep putting tomato ketchup in my face. It actually kind of stings. I'm really hoping people understood that was meant to be like brain juice and blood. Because uh, looking back, I, I think it looks ridiculous. Justin betrays Gorag, however, because Rosie tells him that she actually loves him. Guys still only want one thing, am I right? Yes, knew I could get another one of those into this whole video. And Gorag just kind of lets all the angels and wizards go. Get out! I'm gonna go too if that's okay with you. <laughs> like, he's mad at them, but what are you gonna do, you know? Alex ran off with the moral compass, that's, that's the end of his plan. You know, just go back to Mopin. Justin dumps Rosie so that she can go off to become a real guardian angel. Sort of a self-sacrifice. And that wraps up the angel stuff. But we can't be together. Of course I want to be with you. But the world needs another guardian angel more. Seriously. That's, um... That's it. It's like the writers threw a dart at a board filled with mythical creatures and just went with whatever came up. One day it's werewolves, another day it's gender swapping, and the next day it's angels. All wacky stuff that only really exists in a magical world, am I right? People don't change genders in reality. Wink, Disney. Alex and Justin have a big hug and makeup session. You know, talking about what they owe each other and thanking one another for helping each other. And, uh, um, hey guys, maybe, uh, Apply a little of that sibling responsibility and care towards Max and the whole forced feminization thing you did. Thank you for saving me. It's for all the times that you saved me when I wasn't so good. And for a couple more times in the future so we're even. The post credits scene is the whole family around the talking fruit, who they haven't turned back yet. And the fruit is making a bunch of shitty jokes, to which the family threatens them with the blender. And that's where it ends with the fruit screaming in horror as the family laughs at their pain and fear. <laughs> ah, no blood this time. Um, that should be a good thing, but I think it's more worrying. I do feel a bit lightheaded. Okay, so look, the next episode is the final episode of the Max Gender Swap. Back to Max. And before we go into it, I want to talk about how poorly handled this whole thing has been up until this point. At no time did the writers give us any real stories around Max being forced to be a girl that went deeper than some shallow jokes. The kind of jokes you could only drown in if you really, really tried. Which is a shame, because not doing something more intensive and focused really left it feeling vacuous, and just like that joke I kept making of us waiting for the real actor to come back and pick the arc up again to make it serious. I mean, it is possibly true that the external reality was that they were waiting for the actor to get back, but as a writer, it's your job to take that reality and make it work, to do something that still feeds the development of the character. Max could have had a realisation about girls, about how just being a girl doesn't mean you can't do masculine stuff that he liked to do, and that plenty of girls enjoy playing video games, or 
engaging in physical violence. We could have done an episode showing the siblings really trying to fix Max and learning the limitations of their magic when they mess up. Something that would give them an insight into why you shouldn't mess with people like they did. And that maybe leaping to use magic on someone in anger isn't a good first reaction. It could have been a great bonding moment too, with some serious character apologies from Justin and Alex towards Max for what they did, rather than just ignoring all of that. With that said, what previously happened, happened. And we can only move to the final episode with hope that at least they do something interesting on the way out. That Max getting Genospot back has some sort of comment of some kind. At the very, very least, it's back to being only 20 minutes long rather than 50. So hopefully this will not take too long to get through. The beginning premise of the episode is that Professor Crumbs sees Max as Maxine finally and wonders who that is and the other two have to panic and cover for the whole probably illegal as shit thing they did and absolutely gonna get them into trouble at least thing just when they're about to be reaccepted into Wiz Tech. Who's that adorable little girl? <laughs> it's not Max, cause Max is a boy! I am now suspecting that Justin and Alex are going to fix Max not because it's the right thing to do but because otherwise it's going to impact their own success. How much more self-centered can you make your main characters without them becoming incidental villains? The answer is that they literally are hiding Max from the Professor, despite the fact that, as Max says, the Professor absolutely can turn them back into a boy. He'll know how to turn me back. You missed him. Too late. Too bad. So Justin and Alex are monsters. This whole time, they could have fixed Max, but it would have required them revealing that something happened to Max and taking responsibility for their actions. Something they don't want to do because the responsibility will have consequences. Oh no! Unfortunately though, Justin and Alex's attempt to stop the professor from coming fails because he's already on his way. And oh no, they're now going to have to do the thing they should have been working to do since they first forcibly femmed Max, which is trying to fix Max. And they have to do it now before the professor turns up. Which makes me think, was their original plan just to keep Max as a girl until they learned how to fix it themselves? Which could have been months, or years, or forever. Was that the best plan they had? Because why did anybody feel okay going along with that? Their parents should have probably said something. Someone, somewhere, should have said something. Somebody should be getting involved here in what is very clearly, I didn't want to drop this at the start, but here we are, child abuse. Max has been abused here by his siblings, and his struggle is being ignored by the rest of his family or exploited, which is just more abuse. But we finally kind of get the setup for a story of Max using the being a girl thing to do a normal gender swap plotline. In this case, getting close to a girl he is into so that he can utilize that closeness to talk up the male version of himself to that girl. I need to get into that so I can talk myself up to Talia. That way, when I turn back into Max, she'll already be crushing on me. It's certainly very dodgy and probably not something I would advise anyone try to do in real life because it's a creepy thing to do, but Disney and Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network seem to love that storyline. Mostly though, to end with having the guy learn a valuable lesson about seeing women as people, not objects to manipulate. But Walp has failed at every single stereotype I know so far though, being so lazy they haven't even pulled off the troped gender swap stuff I expect, so who knows what's gonna happen? Maybe there'll be no moral here. Maybe this won't go anywhere. Maybe it won't matter. At the very least, it's not going to teach anybody anything. I can guarantee you that much. Max tells his siblings that he is going to be checking in on them to make sure that the professor is there, which they treat like it's some big deal, but frankly, fair enough. You've all been shit to him and thrown his well-being under the bus for your own gain, so trust doesn't exist anymore there. He should be monitoring you for that stuff. Is Professor Crumbs here yet? Uh, you, you just missed him. What do you mean? He hasn't been here yet. And the class offers to help turn Max back with their combined magic and knowledge because 
Apparently, Justin has let his entire delinquent class in on the information about how they force them to their brother. All right, guys, we can't let Maxine anywhere near Professor Crumbs when he gets here. Otherwise, she's going to tell him that she's Max. Which is honestly some pretty bad secret keeping. Generally, you try to keep as little people in on a secret as possible, especially when it's something like this, where any one of that class with even a slightly good conscience would turn you in to try and help Max. Regardless, Max gets into this School America show that the girl he likes is working on by taking Harper's solo singing performance, which annoys her. Though after that kidnapped sleepover party, I would maybe shut the fuck up, Harper, and let Max have whatever he wants. You're squeezing me a little too tight, Harper. <laughs> Harper! Crumbs turns up before Alex and Justin can apply the spells that they have gathered, though. And so, in a panic, the two throw a bunch of spells at Max, missing Max, hitting Crumbs, and turning Crumbs into a young lad. Why is the door latched? Well, uh, hello, everybody. You know that trope in murder shows and films where somebody murders a person, and then to keep that murder secret, they end up murdering more people until eventually they've killed just a ton of people all for one little murder at the start? This is kind of what Alex and Justin are doing here. And finally, Finally, Justin asks the only right question that anyone has asked this whole time. My gosh, did we cross spells again? What is wrong with us? Yeah, honestly, dude, a lot of things. Crumbs buys their atrocious excuse for what has happened here and tells them that he can totally reverse these kinds of spells. But why would he when he feels so young? So why don't you tell us what's in the potion? Oh, why would I? Dude, you can just magic yourself young whenever you want. Why is this a big deal, except for the obvious reason of making Alex and Justin squirm while they try and figure out how to reverse these spells just so they can fix Max before Crumbs finds out? Yeah, the, the plot really be taking a place above logic in Wizards of Waverly Place that's narrative first, making sense second. Crumbs and Max both drink a potion prepared by Alex from ingredients that she tricked out of the professor. It seems like the potion doesn't work. They all go to the big America show at the school. The potion turns out to actually work, but in fact it was timed just right so that we would get to see Max become a guy wearing girls clothing on the stage. Here the antelope! <coughs> it gets a Big laugh from the IRL audience as the in-show audience is surprised and shocked to see this. And that's that. Max is a guy again, and the next episode is moving on and forgetting everything that happened for the past six episodes. Max joining this America show and the girl that he was interested in and trying to get close to is meaningless to anything and barely exists. It was just a ploy by the writers to have Max be center stage and in a girl's outfit when he transformed. But presumably, comedy. Hugs all round with the family, no big deal is made about any of the shit that happened except for Max saying that it's good to be back. Wait, 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 that's it? We haven't seen you in so long. Yeah, well, I've seen you guys. Been here the whole time. Like, I'm not joking, literally. Max tells Professor Crumbs that Alex and Justin turned him into a girl, and Professor Crumbs is just like, well, they, they turned you back, so... What's the big deal? And then dances off the screen. But they turned us both back again. They're splendid with magic. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just move on to the fucking conclusion already. The conclusion? You're watching the Disney Channel, and this show fucking sucks. The characters are bad, the writing is bad. The themes are bad, the morals are bland, and barely existing, and bad. Consequences don't matter. Arcs don't go anywhere. Honestly, the flaws of the gender swap, with any sort of trans headcanons you might want to do here, are not with the normal stuff that I have a problem with. Namely, cis people using stereotypes and tropes that end up being harmful to trans people. The flaw here is that the show itself barely handles anything well. It misses out on every single classic gender swap option to instead just make a few jokes and progress things nowhere. 
I already sort of covered this in my rant before we did the last episode. And the last episode of Max as a girl did not in any way change that expressed opinion. There are tons of shows out there, a bunch of them that I've reviewed on my channel, with much more hard-hitting, introspective, and interesting storylines that use similar setups to deliver something with crunch and bite, rather than the bland paste we get served up here. Anyway, if you liked what I said here, or enjoyed listening to me speak, or learned something, or just need some sort of instruction for what to do, then you can like, share, subscribe, and comment to do those things. I'm not going to claim that they help engagement or boost me in the algorithm because I'm not sure that's actually true and I think you should only do them if you want to do them, right? Do that stuff if that's something that you feel like you want to engage in. I do pay attention to all the comments on my videos, especially looking for recommendations or possible shows to check out. I love doing classic nostalgia hits like this for people's childhoods. If you really, really like what I've done here, then you can make sure that everybody knows how bad Wizards was as a show, and warn them that the sequel series is probably not going to be as good as their nostalgia goggles might make them believe the original was. Seriously, spread the word. Save lives. Otherwise, you can go to my Patreon or my Ko-Fi, and subscribe there to help fund what I'm doing. The names of those in the five dollar and up category should be on the screen right now, and it's thanks to people like them that I'm able to keep doing this stuff at all, making videos that I love about shows that I enjoy picking apart for others. It's rare to get to make a hobby into a living, and it's especially rarer on YouTube, where copyright claim bots and YouTube clampdowns will steal away any income you might earn from the site itself. And so having this outside source to help pay for stuff really does make the difference. So huge thanks to everyone who signs up to that. You are keeping the channel running smoothly, or as smoothly as I can possibly make it. With all that said, thank you for watching 12,000 words on Wizards of Waverly Place. This was a long one, and I hope you have a great day.